at our university, now is at the Kyoto Sangyo Daiga Group, who is a well-known expert on international affairs on Russia and East Asian uh, politics as well. So without further ado, um, I'll give um, the mic to Tina. Uh, we, have, we have started something new. Uh, we now have put a donation box. So if you want to contribute to ICAST, the more money you give, the more programs you'll be able to enjoy. Uh, it is not required. I mean, there is no KGB enforcer uh, <laughs> waiting for you outside and asking you how much you contributed. Uh, so it's, it's only free. Uh, but uh, thanks again for coming. And Tina, who is yours? home to me by uh, the research that I was doing um, in 2003-2004 when I was living in Moscow. And my research was mainly based on interviews with journalists and politicians. And invariably the first question I was asked by anybody who I sent an interview request to was, who sent you? Uh, and, what, and, what, and what's the agenda behind these questions that you're asking? Um, and a lot of the people who I interviewed uh, were very reluctant to uh, speak to anybody about what was happening in the Russian media during that time. And the, uh, the paranoia that they showed, I think, in some cases is, is quite justified. A large number of the people who I interviewed uh, since, um, since that time have lost their jobs in the uh, mainstream media, have been forced to take jobs in minor news outlets or to take jobs overseas. And in one case, one of the interviews is actually was actually murdered. So it shows just how dangerous and difficult it is to be a journalist in contemporary <coughs> Russia. And some of the places that people asked to be interviewed away from prying eyes also showed how uh, difficult it is to be a journalist in Russia today. Um, one interviewee wanted to meet in a, a burlesque club at three o'clock in the morning in the suburbs of Russia. Another wanted to meet on a boat moored in the river Moskova. So um, as far away from po as possible from uh, the authorities and from the, uh, the managers of their media companies. And I think the media today in Russia is uh, an important subject of study because what's been happening in the media sector over the past decade since Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000 really uh, has ramifications and is, is in, in some ways a microcosm of what's been happening in, in the wider uh, political system under Vladimir Putin. In the past decade, Russia's really become a hybrid political regime. And by that, I mean that it's a, a regime that shows elements of democracy, but also uh, elements of authoritarianism. This type of regime, which is in no way limited to Russia, um, combines very high degrees of uh, centralization of power in the state, along with the gutting of uh, seemingly democratic institutions. Almost immediately after Putin came to power in March 2000, television was the first institution in Russia that experienced the tightening of the state's grip. And the methods and mechanisms that were used to uh, increase state control over the media 
were later used and deployed against other democratic institutions, political parties, and uh, the Russian parliament, the Duma. All of these, as well, along with the regional uh, media and the regional uh, parliaments and political machine, were all similarly subjugated to the Kremlin uh, in the first few years of the uh, Putin administration. So tonight I'd like to look at how Putin was able to increase uh, state power over democratic and social institutions in Russia, and why the opposition, both societal and political, was so weak in the face of this creeping authoritarianism. I'd also like to offer a few thoughts on the stability and the strength of the current hybrid system in Russia, especially as we approach the next round of federal elections in Russia. There will be parliamentary elections in December this year and presidential elections uh, next March, March 2012. And um, I argue that the financial crisis in 2008 and the ramifications of the financial crisis, along with the emergence of a tandem leadership between Putin and Mirvedev, um, is beginning to create an environment in which we're beginning to see perhaps uh, the embryonic beginnings of societal activism and political pluralism that may emerge um, or re-emerge in the next uh, 18 months. And if it does, it will perhaps have ramifications for the media and allow uh, a somewhat limited uh, amount of uh, media freedom to be reinstated. In Russia today, the function of the media is strongly curtailed. It doesn't promote political competition. It doesn't hold the government to account. And the media outlets that exist are either used as a political tool by the state or else marginalized to the point where they have no real impact on political decision making. And this deficiency is caused by a lack of an enabling environment around the media. Political pluralism, the separation of powers, the rule of law, all of these things are missing in contemporary Russia. The government pays very little attention to human rights and to freedoms, and the public show very little demand for these kinds of political participations or civil liberties, and in particular, very little demand for media liberty. But it wasn't always thus. In the 1980s, in the late 1980s, Russia's journalists were at the forefront of the uh, movement for change, the Glasnost movement, and they played a central role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. During the Gorbachev era, we saw uh, a new generation of independent journalists coming to the fore and leading the charge for democratic reform. The media pluralism that followed the collapse of the Soviet Union was largely propelled by uh, ideological splits between conservative hardliners and new reform orientated elites. In 1990, shortly before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia's first independent newspaper was launched, and it was called just that, an uh, independent newspaper. And it described itself as the first Western-styled, respectable, objective newspaper of the Soviet era. And it brought together a team of young journalists, many of them with no experience at all in working in the media. But to these journalists, that was, a, was an advantage. Um, they saw themselves as wanting to break away from the Soviet legacy and to have nothing to do with the Soviet past. Um, they wouldn't allow their media to be an instrument of the Communist Party regime as the media had been previously. So these young journalists were fast teaching themselves the art of trustworthy and objective media reporting. But most of all, they were guided by their defiance of the state authority. So as the media begins to develop its independence in the Soviet Union, the most, uh, guiding, the most important guiding principle for journalists is to, to defy state authority. And this is a culture that we see continuing into the Putin era, which has led to some of the conflict between Putin and the journalists in Russia today. The 1993 Russian constitution constitutionally guaranteed the freedom of the media. It ended censorship and the state monopoly on the ownership of the media and allowed a multiplicity of viewpoints to be publicly expressed. The market reforms that were instituted after the collapse of communism stimulated the growth of a private media sector. And in particular, uh, the television sector began to grow and flourish with a lot of um, people investing into private television companies. Throughout the 90s, private television networks demonstrated their independence from the state with their frequent criticism of Russia's first president, Boris Yeltsin. 
Although more often the product of information wars between different elites than any commitment to independent journalism, Russian television in the 1990s provided audiences with a plurality of opinions. Critical coverage of the first war in Chechnya in particular confirmed the reputation of private television companies as serious independent alternatives to state broadcasters. However, the trust that the media uh, built up with their coverage of the Chechen war between 1994 and 1996 was undermined by the reporting of the 1996 presidential elections. And this was the election in which Yeltsin stood for uh, re-election. Um, Yeltsin was very unpopular in the lead up to the election as a result of uh, the chaos that had, had uh, the chaos that had, that had been created by his market reforms in the early 1990s. And on the eve of the election, Yeltsin's uh, approval rating stood at just 2%. Yeltsin's main rival uh, was the leader of the Communist Party, Gennady Zuganov, and it looked like Zuganov could actually win the election in 1996. So journalists faced a, a difficult choice, their choice between supporting Yeltsin, who'd been in, in, in many ways an ineffective president, or supporting, or, 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 or by staying neutral, perhaps allowing the communist candidate to win the election a communist candidate who they feared would return the media to state monopoly and would remove media freedom. So reluctantly, the media threw their lot in behind Yeltsin um, and promoted an image of Yeltsin as being somebody who um, was uh, fit to lead the country despite all the rumors of Yeltsin's ailing health, somebody who was fit and virile. This picture here shows a, a concert that Yeltsin attended during the 1996 election campaign demonstrating his healthfulness by uh, dancing the funky chicken with a bunch of lo young, lovely Russian ladies. And Yeltsin won the election, um, albeit in a second round of presidential voting. And after he was re-elected, he rewarded the owners of media outlets who'd supported his campaign, for example, by uh, extending their licenses to broadcast. And he did this by uh, passing presidential decrees. But Russian audiences never forgot the fact that the media uh, became partisan during this election campaign. The 1996 election campaign and Putin's own election victory in, uh, in March 2000 showed Putin that the media had uh, an important role to play in uh, bestowing political power. In August 1999, Yeltsin surprised many in Russian political circles by appointing Vladimir Putin to be his new prime minister. At that point, Putin was a relatively unknown person in, uh, in Russia, uh, outside of the political elites. He'd previously been the head of the FSB, which is the replacement of, of the KGB. So when he became uh, prime minister in August 1999, and um, in opinion polls, he was... Uh, he was thought of as being a potential successor to Yeltsin by only 2% of Russian voters. And yet, less than six months later, in March um, 2000, Yel uh, sorry, Putin won the presidential election with a landslide, winning in the first round of presidential elections with about 52% of the vote. So Putin's rapid rise in part lies with the favorable and frequent coverage he received on uh, state-owned television channels during the 2000 election campaign. But media support really only partly explains why uh, Putin won the election in, in 2000. Putin came to that election with a vision uh, for the future of Russia that was shared by a large majority of the Russian population. And this vision was that the post-communist years had been a period of weakness and humiliation for Russia, uh, and a period when the West had largely taken advantage of Russians, uh, Russia's enfeebled position. Putin promised that he would restore Russia's national pride, he would restore political and economic order after the uh, bruising political struggles that had uh, characterized the late Yeltsin period. During the Yeltsin era, uh, political power in Russia fragmented across different political elites, uh, and elites that were hostile to Yeltsin largely uh, attempted to sabotage his agenda or ignored his, uh, ignored his rulings and legislation entirely. Uh, 
But I want to estimate in uh, 2000, Putin inherited a situation in which as much as 30% of regional laws ran counter to federal legislation. Acts of terrorism, notably the apartment bombings in Moscow in 1999, uh, the lawlessness and civil war that reigned in Chechnya, the fact that uh, a large number of state employers were unable to pay wages on time, pensions were not being paid, even the army wasn't receiving its pay packets on time. This kind of situation of chaos, uh, in, many, in many voters' minds, suggested that Russia needed a strong, it needed strong leadership. And Putin was there to uh, fill this, this, uh, this vacuum. So these are some of the many different images of Vladimir Putin uh, that were promoted by the media as a way of, uh, of, uh, of promoting his political candidacy. So Putin, uh, in contrast to Yeltsin, the ailing, aging Yeltsin, Puto, the, the, the judo master, Putin, the man of action, flying planes, and Putin also a kind, caring side, nice to dogs, but not quite so nice to Siberian tigers. <laughs> By the end of Putin's presidency in May 2008, the position of the national television media in Russia had undergone a dramatic change. In comparison to the reporting of the first Chechen war, uh, which was very defiant of the Yeltsin administration, coverage of the second Chechen conflict was very tame. Television channels that did challenge Putin over controversial issues, uh, such as the sinking of the Kursk submarine, or uh, terrorist attacks in Moscow, or the ongoing war in Chechnya, was subject to a variety of different sanctions. Rather than relying on directly repressive methods or the direct uh, censorship that was used by the Soviets, the methods used by Vladimir Putin to control the media have been much more subtle. The Kremlin wouldn't shut down or, or harass journalists, wouldn't shut down the media outlets or harass the journalists, but instead they would attack the media tycoons who owned the media businesses. And the tycoons were easier targets for uh, two reasons. Firstly, private property rights in general in Russia are highly questionable because of the fast and uncharted redistribution of Soviet state assets in the 1990s. Big fortunes in post-Soviet Russia are, in, at least in part, the product of special relationships with uh, members of the ruling elite. Secondly, uh, the new wealthy are broadly regarded by the majority of Russians as fat cats, people enriching themselves at the expense of the people. So the public are only too happy to see a tycoon in trouble. The campaign instigated by Putin against MTV, uh, a private television company, that was the epitome of defiant coverage of the first war in Chechnya. Um, the, the campaign against NTV and its owner, Vladimir Gazinsky, who was Russia's biggest media mogul, was disguised as a commercial litigation. The eventual takeover of NTV uh, uh, by the state-controlled gas monopoly, Gazprom, was portrayed as the legal resolution of a business dispute. A poll taken, uh, an opinion poll taken after the takeover in April 2001 showed that the majority of people accepted this interpretation that it was a business dispute. And only 4% of people saw the, uh, the takeover of NTV as an encroachment by the state authorities on press freedom. All three of Russia's major television channels, um, of, of Russia's three major television channels, only one was controlled by the state when Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000. On the eve of his re-election in 2004, all three had come under the control of the state or the state's proxies. Soon after NTV was taken over by Gazprom, uh, rules uh, on, and uh, the environment around the media was, uh, was constrained even further. Live political talk shows, for example, were closed, everything had to be pre-recorded. Political satire shows disappeared and several popular TV hosts who were critical of the Kremlin were barred from television. On the eve of President Putin's re-election in, uh, in March 2004, Putin stood virtually unchallenged. With the outcome of the election being uh, an almost foregone conclusion, uh, the majority of the leaders of opposition parties refused to put up a candidate uh, to stand against him 
or put up somebody second rate. In the case of uh, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia, uh, misnamed because this party is actually a, a neo-fascist party, the leader of the party refused to stand himself because he didn't want to be humiliated by coming such a dismal second to Vladimir Putin and actually put up his own bodyguard as a candidate instead. So this gives you some idea of the quality of the candidate standing against Putin in 2004. But because the candidates standing against Putin were, were such second raters, the election began to look like it might descend into farce. Turnout would be incredibly low. And so in the last few weeks before the end of the election campaign, TV gave uh, an inordinate amount of positive coverage to the communist candidate as a way of trying to make him look like a viable alternative to Putin, like a viable candidate. So this shows that in a hybrid regime, in, a, in a, an illiberal democratic regime, too much control over the media can actually uh, backfire or can have negative consequences for the regime as it can bring into, uh, it can bring into question its legitimacy. In 2007, when Vladimir Putin declared Dmitry Medvedev to be his desired successor for the presidency, all three of the major Russian television channels turned their attention to Medvedev and made him the chief subject of their news broadcasts. Soon after he won the presidential election with about 70% of the vote, um, we begin to see a situation where both uh, Putin and Medvedev become the dual feature of most evening news broadcasts. It doesn't matter if what they do is newsworthy, they're still the lead story on the two main uh, state broadcasters. So since uh, 2008, when Miamadev became president, we see the two together dominating news coverage. <coughs> now, it's not that Russian people or Russian audiences are unaware of the manipulative nature of Russian politics and the media system that's developed in Russia since Vladimir Putin came to power. The cynicism and the double think that shaped the public's attitude to television during the Brezhnev era, era in, um, in the 1960s and 70s remains ubiquitous today. The Russian sociologist Yuri uh, Levada uh, made an insightful comment about the mindset of Russian audiences. He said it's naive to think that Russian audiences are tricked into believing that what they see on media screens is, uh, is, is the truth, that people understand that this is manipulation. But he argues that Soviet audiences and, and Russian audiences following on from them are not only totally, uh, not only tolerate this kind of deception by the state, but are willing to be deceived and practice a kind of self-deception for the sake of their own self-preservation. So following in this pattern, Russian audiences today stay reconciled to the Kremlin's policies and they accept these policies with, with, uh, with, with, with some speed because the Putin regime has been able to generously compensate them for their compliance with the regime. The blessing of oil and gas reserves means that Putin's been able to deliver for people better living standards than any previous Russian government. And people are generally grateful for this improvement in living standards and also for the reasserting of Russia's interests on the international stage. The movement of Chechen terrorism from within the Caucasus to other states within Russia it, from 1999 has also had an impact on, uh, on audiences' tolerance for criticism of the state and of their president on television. The siege by Chechen terrorists at the Nordos Theater in October 2002 um, was broadcast live on NTV, which is, at that stage still had a relative independence from the state, from the Kremlin. Putin, after the uh, broadcast, said that this broadcast had been made in blood and that it actually aided the terrorists. In the immediate aftermath of that event, the director general of the channel was sacked and replaced by somebody more loyal to the Kremlin. There wasn't a whimper from Russian audiences, no protests, no one came to the barricades to support NTV. In general, a large percentage of the population agreed with Putin that in times of crisis, the media should support the government. So this is not the same kind of attitude as we see in the first war, when public uh, outrage at the suffering in Chechnya that they'd seen on television forced Yeltsin to negotiate a settlement. The second war has been very different, and I think it's been different mainly because the front of the war has moved to Russian cities. As with Russian audiences, many, uh, but by no means all Russian journalists, have been complicit, if not participants, then complicit non-participants, 
in the Kremlin's effort to limit their professional freedom. Political TV broadcasts uh, at the national level are managed by the joint efforts of the Kremlin and the managers of uh, TV stations. The managers of TV stations meet with the Kremlin once a week on Fridays um, to draw up the schedule for the news for that week. They then stay in touch with the Kremlin throughout the week to finally tune uh, TV coverage. This system was honed during Putin's presidency and has remained operative uh, since he handed over power to Dmitry Medvedev. In exchange for fulfilling uh, this critically important political position for the state, top TV managers are rewarded with very high incomes and lucrative business opportunities. While national television stars are handsomely rewarded for their role in perpetuating this uh, Kremlin-managed media system, journalists working in the print media and regional television are forced to get by on very low income to, uh, pittance. The Russian media market is a very competitive one, with around 10,000 outlets in a variety of different mediums. The advertising market in Russia is very underdeveloped and the revenues are very low. So to make ends meet, uh, a number of journalists resort to taking bribes. For example, uh, to write a, a favorable story about a business or to rubbish somebody's business rival. And this practice of journalism for hire has made uh, average Russian people very unsympathetic towards the, uh, the journalistic profession, which is another reason why audiences have been reluctant to come to the barricades and support uh, journalists and media outlets when they come under attack by the Kremlin. In the interviews that I conducted for this book, um, many of the journalists I interviewed who'd, interviewed, who'd been critics of Putin uh, in the early 2000s, reported that because of the war in Chechnya and because of the terrorist attacks in Moscow, they felt that the media was now obliged to uh, promote order and national unity. And this meant being less critical of the Kremlin and of the presidency. After the Nordost uh, theater siege in 2000, the president's press secretary, Alexei Gromov, General Gromov, a former member of the KGB, called on journalists to adopt a new form of self-regulation when reporting on Chechnya or reporting on terrorism. Fearing that if they didn't comply with this self-regulation that the Kremlin would impose even more draconian measures upon them, Media uh, outlets and, and their managers agreed to sign a new, co a new code, effectively a code of self-censorship. Russian television journalists adopted this code um, and said again that they were guided by the principle of doing no harm. That in a, per in a period of time when terrorism was a, was a reality in Russian cities, they didn't want to make the situation worse by reporting in such a way that um, could be detrimental, uh, especially when events were unfolding uh, live. In comparative terms, Russian, journal Russian journalists here are not exceptional. The do no harm principle has motivated media elsewhere in the world to adopt a code of self-censorship. Uh, for example, if we look at the five major uh, US networks after September the 11th, they all agreed to stop live broadcasts and to um, suppress any cause for violence against America. Although the Putin administration is not unique in trying to control the flow of information in a time of war or national crisis, the fact that Russia lacks any kind of societal constraints on government, is, this is what really distinguishes Russia from the situation in the West. In Western democracies, corporate ownership, legal rights, journalistic solidarity, public support for a free press, all of these things prevent the government from punishing media outlets uh, for... Uh, for for broadcasting messages that the state are unhappy or, or find critical. Um, in Russia, there are no similar constraints on government influence. Vladimir Putin focused uh, the, the vast amount of his attention on the television media, mainly because it's television, and national television in particular, is the main source of information about uh, politics for Russian audiences, although this, this was certainly true when he first became president in March 2000. The situation has changed uh, somewhat since then, with more uh, Russians having access to the internet, for example. But uh, although increasing numbers of people have access to the internet, among Putin's core supporters, who are mainly older, 
rural dwelling, people on lower incomes and of low edu uh, lower education. Television remains the most important source of information for those groups. So although television has been um, mainly controlled, uh, quite heavily controlled by the Kremlin, the Kremlin doesn't seek to stifle every media voice in Russia. Um, recently, uh, Russia's uh, version of uh, Newsweek magazine published an article that, uh, that talked about the encroachment of media freedom uh, on television, and that was uh, published in Russian in, in Russia. But it has a very small audience, uh, Newsweek Russia, and therefore, because it was only read by a small number of people, mainly people in the elite who have access to outside information and outside sources, uh, the Kremlin doesn't take steps to control these kind of sources. You can also find a large amount of criticism of the, uh, of the Kremlin and also a large amount of free journalism on the internet. Um, also in print publications, especially uh, in uh, a couple of the main newspapers, Novaya Gazetia, uh, New Times, Komersan, uh, Vodomosti, we see a lot of criticism, a lot of independent journalism still exists. And I think that um, the Putin administration has seen it as being uh, useful to allow a limited amount of uh, media freedom for four main reasons. Uh, firstly, the Kremlin tolerates uh, some free media because it's good for show. The fact that such media operate relatively independently lessens the feeling in society that freedom of expression is being squelched. And therefore, this reduces the incentives for people to rebel and call for more media freedom. Secondly, the existence of a relatively free print media is also helpful internationally. Uh, when Putin uh, is uh, criticized by uh, foreign leaders or foreign governments for, for cracking down on media freedom, he can point to the print media and say, well, look, these outlets are relatively free. So uh, there, are, there, are, there, is, there are free journalists and free media in Russia. And again, this may be true, but the number of independent media outlets uh, is irrelevant as long as political authority is monopolized by the leadership and the public remains fragmented and apathetic. The experience of countries uh, like the uh, former Yugoslavia under uh, Milosevic or Ukraine under uh, Kuchma demonstrate that even a very limited number of free media outlets can make a difference and effectively promote uh, political competition if the public are driven and, and well organized. But in Russia, even the advanced and educated audiences of alternative news sources accept this tacit pact with the government which keeps them sidelined from participating in national affairs. Third, the state has permitted the continuation of an existence of some independent media outlets because they serve as bulletin boards on which uh, players in politics and business can make public some piece of information. And this information is normally aimed primarily at Russia's most important audience or Russia's most important reader, Vladimir Putin. The regime can then respond to elite demands and rivalries before their discontent uh, renews elite war and elite struggle, which, uh, which undermine the Yeltsin presidency. Putin's Kremlin is made up of several different elite groups. Uh, a, a group uh, coming mainly from the security services, a group of liberal lawyers from St. Petersburg, uh, a group of, uh, of mainly economists. So there are various different competing elites within the Putin administration. In part, Putin's power has been sustained by being the arbiter of the disputes between these different groups. Ensuring that all of these groups have uh, access to the spoils of office, uh, feeling like they're being equally treated by Putin has been the source of his political power. Fear that Dmitry Medvedev wouldn't be able to fulfill this role as arbiter between elite disputes and struggles was what, one of the factors that drove uh, Putin to stay prime minister in Russia and to not exit the political scene in 2008. A fourth reason why uh, the continuation of an independent media has been useful is that it's an important source of independent information for the state itself about developments in the country. And potential societal problems and discontents will uh, be, made, be made apparent to the state in order that it can then respond to these societal 
um, problems before they become such a large problem that they actually undermine support for the, for the presidency. The government makes sure that the remaining independent media are kept marginalised and, uh, and that they present no apparent challenge to the state. First and foremost, these outlets are kept separate from the national television. So there's no format such as Meet the Press, in which print or web journalists um, are allowed to address a broader national audience on television. Access to information is also tightly restricted. Public briefings with po uh, top policy makers and politicians don't happen in Russia. Throughout his presidency, Putin never faced a single unfriendly question from a Russian support, uh, reporter. Those who did raise unwelcome questions uh, would not, or those who would raise unwelcome questions were not given access to the president. And those who were given uh, access were not inquisitive. The Kremlin has also become much more experienced at managing the media. In the Yeltsin era, uh, era, politicians were very often very open with the media, friends with journalists. Unlike his predecessor, Putin doesn't believe in the friendship of journalists. His administration is much more careful about what it reveals to the media. Putin has also proved very adept at keeping the conflicts within his administration behind closed doors. There are still conflicts going on between the different elites in the Kremlin, often with the same protagonists as under uh, Yeltsin, but these are much more hidden, much more vague. By limiting what information is available to journalists, the Putin administration was able to keep control of the political agenda away from the media. As a result, it looked like there were far fewer critics of Putin among the elite than there were of Yeltsin. However, in times of domestic crisis, uh, the Putin administration has actually found it difficult to keep control, cr control over the flow of information. So for example, during the Nordost uh, theater hostage seize, seizing in 2002, and during the Beslan hostage taking at the school, <coughs> South Ossetia, in 2004. State leverage over those who choose to pursue independent editorial lines is virtually unlimited. Changing the ownership of media outlets, which proved so effective uh, when it came to the takeover of NTV, has been repeated uh, again and again uh, in both the television sector and in the print media. And so now most major uh, media outlets are under the ownership of uh, somebody loyal to the Kremlin, somebody who can rein in his employees if asked to, if, if it's deemed necessary by the Kremlin. Control over the legislature makes it possible to pass a law or to amend a law in order to restrain the media. So for example, in 2001, when NTV was in financial difficulty, when Gazprom, uh, uh, an organization that had given a loan to NTV, recalled that loan, the, uh, media, the American media mogul Ted Turner was putting together a bid to rescue NTV, to, to buy a stake in NTV. Parliament then passed a law prohibiting a, a foreign ownership or a large stake foreign ownership in Russian media companies. Other levers of control include licensing, uh, access to broadcasting licenses, uh, and also the government owns a large number of, of the majority of printing presses in Moscow. In Chechnya, the rules have been changed uh, in the second war as opposed to the first war. It's now very difficult for journalists to go to Chechnya without accreditation from, uh, from the Kremlin or from the Defense Ministry. And if you do go to Chechnya, you have to agree to a military es uh, escort. So you only get taken to the places that the Russian military are willing to show you as a journalist. Um, to be fair to the Kremlin, the second Chechen war has been a lot more dangerous than the first for journalists. And we saw a large number of uh, kidnappings of journalists. So this accreditation, to some extent, is, is, uh, is necessary. Because journalists operate by the grace and favor of the government, self-censorship has become ubiquitous. Um, although the degrees of self-censorship uh, vary significantly across different media outlets. Reporters working for prominent Moscow publications feel more secure because the overwhelming majority of their critically minded readership are concentrated in the capital. So they may count on some, albeit limited, public support. Also, the government is still somewhat sensitive 
to negative publicity, uh, in particular to criticism from the international community about their treatment of the media. Uh, harassment and prosecution of journalists, as well as the closure of publications, are not uncommon in Russia. Russia also has an abysmal record of physical assaults and assassinations of journalists. Um, although there's no evidence that the, uh, the, the uh, journalists have been murdered on the orders of the Kremlin, the Kremlin doesn't do very much to try and change this culture of, uh, of violence towards uh, journalists, and it doesn't instigate uh, investigations or very thorough instigations into the murder of journalists. So in conclusion then, the political system Putin has built rests on three important foundations. One, uh, oil and gas revenues. Two, the traditional uh, passivity of Russian society. And three, elite consensus on cooperation with Putin. There's some uh, evidence that this, that this tripartite system is beginning to be undermined. Firstly, uh, by uh, economic, uh, the economic situation. In 2008, uh, in the last quarter, uh, Russia experienced its first uh, negative growth since Putin came to office in 2000. Uh, the price of oil dropped to less than a third of its previous level, and Putin's carefully orchestrated system was suddenly tested by circumstances beyond his control. Um, the Russian economy uh, did recover, although a lot slower than most of the other countries in the G20, and, Rus uh, and the Russian leadership managed to uh, ride out this storm, this test, largely thanks to the popularity of Putin and the fact that there's no real visible alternative to the current administration. There's some evidence that the Kremlin recognizes that it needs to diversify the economy away from dependence on oil, and that this requires uh, modernization, and this will in turn require help from more developed nations. Um, so this is one of the things that's been driving reproachment and the reset of relations with the West. But with elections coming up in 2011 and 2012, um, the main rivals to Putin and uh, Medvedev are on the ultra-right of the political spectrum. It, it's questionable how much space they're going to actually have to undertake a detente with the West uh, in order to fulfill this policy of modernization. Another problem is that policy making in the Putin administration rests with too few individuals. Um, in 2002, um, the Institute for Public Projects in Moscow, Moscow estimated that around 200 people, uh, or 200 individuals, were involved in uh, high level decision making uh, in the administration. Uh, this number has now shrunk to 50 uh, individuals. And while the list in 2002 included people from business, from political parties, the list now is mostly exclusively drawn just from the administration. A small pool of people taking decisions is leading to a stagnation in policy. We haven't seen uh, much uh, innovative thinking coming from the Kremlin since the early 2000s when the administration had a larger presence of, uh, of liberals and people drawn from uh, across the political spectrum. We've also seen uh, a larger number of political protests and societal protests since 2005. Uh, the most recent, at uh, the end of last year, after the murder of, of, uh, of a football fan after a game in Moscow. Um, also protests over social benefits reform, which forced the government to retract their uh, benefits changes. Um, it's possible that these uh, protests could, could, uh, could develop into something more significant especially um, if, there's any other, if there's any future economic downturn. And finally, the, uh, the fact that there are now two political uh, post potential candidates for the presidency in 2012, the fact that power is now uh, dual-centered in Russia, um, is opening up uh, some, uh, some potential for, uh, for difficulty. Although, if we look at the policies of Medvedev and Putin, there's really not a nuts hair between them. Um, some members of the elite who are becoming less enamored with Putin are, are gravitating towards Medvedev, realizing that right now he plays second fiddle to Putin, but thinking perhaps in the future that his political capital will rise. Um, and so there's the potential for divisions to open up between these two. Um, just recently after the bombing, of uh, Moscow airport, uh, Putin said very soon after the bombing that perpetrators had been identified. 
Um, and then Miavidev publicly said, well, actually, nobody should be saying that yet because nobody has been identified as a perpetrator. So we see Miavidev uh, publicly admonishing uh, uh, Putin. And this is quite a new, uh, a new development in their relationship. Nobody really knows yet which of the two will stand for the presidency in 2012. Perhaps uh, Miavidev's visit to the Northern Territories in November last year was evidence of him trying to uh, shore up his nationalist and patriotic credentials ahead of a run for the presidency in 2012. But Putin uh, has undertaken similar PR exercises of his own, driving across Siberia last summer a thousand miles in a larder that could only really have been done for political purposes, I think. So this interleague conflict which may erupt between uh, supporters of, Yelp, uh, of Putin and Medvedev um, may not be true uh, democratic political competition, but it's probably the best we can hope for in the near future in Russia. And if we do see uh, some competition between these two political figures, we may see a limited space for the return of media pluralism. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Um, responsibility to let you speak, but uh, before doing so, may I make some comments? Yes, comments, if you want to touch on the Russia-Japan relationship. Well, well yeah, this, this is beautiful, <laughs> on the, on the but uh, thank you very much, and Tina, and it's been really fascinating. Uh, so, I might like to offer uh, three, three comments. Uh, first, uh, I think what we did was very important. Why? Because, uh, when we talk about East Asia now, I think everybody talks about China, right of China. And I think th this is probably the most important issue in East Asia. But all the more so, we need to think the rise of China strategically, which means that we need to think about the powers which, is around, which are around China. And Russia is a clearly one. And so I think all the, all the more China is becoming important, uh, we, we need to have a correct understanding of Russia. Of Russia. And uh, today you made a uh, really important uh, contribution. Why? Because uh, uh, when we think about Russia, well, historically there was Soviet Union, the, the, the a totalitarian state. But when Gorbachev came into power in 1985, clearly Soviet Union, Russia began to change. And that, was such a, that change was fascinating, really fascinating. And uh, so the Soviet Union fell, and the Yeltsin came in, the Russian Federation came into power, and Russia became democratic. And I think truly, in this change, the change toward democracy in Russia, uh, everybody who was dealing with Russia, with Clinton in the United States, and I've been dealing with Russia at different times before this period. We thought that Russia became a democratic, but Russia is moving toward a democratic country. But then Putin came in, and something began to change. And at least uh, Russia became autocratic. But what was the exact state of change in the new Russia saying, as the old Soviet Union, was some, something different. It, it is very difficult to understand what were the elements which persisted, but, and what are the elements which changed. And I think in today's presentation, through analyzing the Western media, you made a really fascinating analysis of what has remained and what has changed. And uh, in a nutshell, I, I understood that uh, Putin, and the new way to include it, uh, by way of controlling the three major television channels, uh, getting the, 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 the uh, largest sources of information for the public. And, uh, but, but it's not only the control. It is the, the way Russian people are accepting the line coming in through this uh, uh, channel. It is the, the, uh, the elite and the people who basically accept their policy, which create this, uh, uh, this harmony. 
but side by side with this uh, 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 major direction, there is uh, this uh, uh, marginalized media, freedom of media in several bits and pieces. That is very different from the Soviet Union. During the Soviet Union days, we didn't have this. And I, my, my own experience really coincides with, with yours. When I talk to the Russians, we can't talk anything. And even in this small media, uh, we are allowed to have certain appearance. In a way, we are allowed to have an appearance in the European media. In the Soviet Union days, that was clearly non-existent. And this gives certain balance in keeping up the sort of freedom of expression of will. And the way you described today really, uh, I think, gets to this right proportion. And the third, you know, the, this uh, uh, new situation. I have been thinking that uh, although, although you know, as you mentioned, uh, in some instances, Medvedev is trying to speak a bit different from Putin. But fundamentally, they are uh, the, the sort of a uh, friend, yeah, friend. And Putin is the, 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 the clearly the more senior. Putin introduced or invited Medvedev. And that power relations, relationship basically stays. And so, for the uh, 2012 elections, uh, there may be some uh, maybe frictions uh, between the followers of each, but the, the personal relationship between Putin and Medvedev Medi Medi will stay, and uh, whoever becomes president, that tenderness uh, 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 will stay. That, that was my impression, but I think you mentioned something slightly more nuanced than the sort of simplistic uh, understanding which I had. And my last question, you sort of uh, concluding point, we mentioned about uh, uh, japan russia relations. Uh, but uh, uh, what, what, what are the main message appearing in these three uh, major television channels on uh, Russian policy toward Japan? And do you see any nuances in this uh, uh, marginalized media about uh, Russia's uh, uh, width of policy toward Japan? Follow my question. The situation with Japan, although it, it generates a lot of media interest in Japan, generates relatively little in Russia. Um, there was an opinion poll done, I think a couple of weeks ago, asking about Medvedev's visit and the follow-up visit to the Northern Territories, asking people, have you heard about it? And 45% of people said they hadn't heard about it, another 20% said they'd vaguely heard something. So only around 30% of people were really following the story, and I think in Japan that number will be much higher. So although it gets a lot of, uh, it generates a lot of interest in Japan, it doesn't generate so much interest in Russia, and I don't think that's because the Kremlin controls the media and they don't want this story out there. I think it's because there just isn't the same interest, especially in what's going on in, in the far east of, of Russia, among the population of, of, of the majority of Russia, of European Russia, which is about 80% of the population. So there isn't really, from my reading of the of the media, as, as much interest or following of this story in Russia as there is in um, in Japan. Which begs the question, if, if Medvedev was, was intending on visiting uh, Kunishiri as a, as a kind of uh, part of a political campaign for the presidency, and it's not really being covered in Russia, did he, did he waste his time? Um, but yeah, I, I get the impression that it just doesn't generate as much interest on that side as it does. As it does here, there was some. I think what actually generated more interest was the visit of uh, of the Japanese foreign minister to uh, Moscow in February, and that was covered a lot more, mainly in the context of his uh, his comments about Medvedev's visit just before the president, uh, just just before the uh, the bilateral talks in, in Moscow. So that was actually the sort of focus, the, the comment by the prime minister, and also by uh, Mai Harutan as well. So that, that generated more interest among the media than the actual visit previously. How about the power relationship between these two? The power relationship between the two, well, I mean, you said you think the tandem will possibly stay. I think that depends on who becomes president. If Medvedev becomes president, the tandem will stay. If Putin becomes president, I don't know if Medvedev will continue to hold senior office. And I think really, I mean, it's up to Putin. If Putin decides he's going to stand as president, then he'll stand as president, and I think it's very unlikely that Medvedev will stand against him. 
He holds all of the cards, and it's basically his decision to make. So, uh, please. It's a very primitive question. Uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. If you can identify yourself. Oh, sorry. Sato this, small Jesus Sato. I have one question about the elite. I would like to know more about the profiles of the elite. It's 200 people surrounded by to promote the policy making, then I need to know what they are. Please. Okay, well it's down to about 50 now. Uh, and most of those people are within the administration. But as I mentioned, the administration um, is often portrayed in, uh, in the Western press as being made, mainly made up of ex-KGB security personnel. And they are a significant faction within the Kremlin, but they're counterbalanced by, uh, by elites coming from other backgrounds. Now, Putin does have a background in the KGB, but he also, uh, in the 1990s, worked as a, a political officer for the mayor of St. Petersburg, who was a very liberal and democratic politician. So um, uh, Putin left the KGB in order to work for this individual, trained as a lawyer as well. So he has quite a complex and interesting background. Um, and his Kremlin reflects the man himself. So the Kremlin's uh, political elite is made up of you know, some personal friends of Putin from his time in St. Petersburg. And Myrvidev is one of those people. Uh, he's somebody he came across in St. Petersburg, Myrvidev himself from St. Petersburg, also a lawyer. So that's another group. They're also a group of relatively liberal-minded lawyers, uh, sorry, uh, economists, who are part of the uh, uh, Kremlin uh, current administration. So the elite uh, is actually made up of, of different groups. And as I said, you know, part of Putin's power lies in being uh, the, the arbiter between the, the, these different elite groups. And all, uh, all of the groups trust that Putin will just divide uh, the spoils of office, if you like, and, and, and power between these groups equally. And that trust in his uh, benevolence has what stopped a lot of these elite groups. They still have tit-for-tat squabbles. And in the lead up to the 2008 presidential election, when no one knew if Putin was going or who was going to be his successor, we started to see quite a lot of tit-for-tat behavior between these different elite groups. For example, um, the, uh, the prosecutor general, one of his protégés uh, being arrested, probably at the hands of, uh, of another individual in another elite group. So this kind of behavior started to happen just in the lead up to the election, which is possibly one of the reasons why Putin decided to stay. Um, some people think he always intended to stay, but personally I think there was a lot of, a lot of these the elite squabbles that were beginning to come to the surface again that convinced him that he left the political scene then instability would return. What about the political members or armed forces generals? Well, there are... Are uh, they consistent of the membership of the uh, elite? They're normally classed under the same group as a sort of security apparatus, so that includes... So security. Yeah, yeah. So the number of people with military or, or, or uh, security service background who are members of the current administration, government or presidential administration, is around 34% of the total. But, but not the majority, which I think is important to remember. And remember also that, I mean, in the Soviet period, a, a lot of the brightest and best students would go into the KGB, it's a good career. So people who are in the sort of 50s, Putin's generation now, a lot of the best people of their generation went into those careers. <coughs> it was a very different culture at that time, let's remember. So. I'm Max Irving, Office of Conor Thurrell. Um, I wondered if you could tell me a bit more about the um, different reactions according to age among the general public in Russia to, to the, the actions of the Kremlin. With particular reference, I was thinking of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which is much closer to, um, to European Russia than many other places. Um, which was inspired in large part by young people protesting. And whether or not there's a difference in reactions between the generation you just mentioned, you know, who, who had a, a folk memory of, of the, the last days of communism, and a younger generation who won't have seen that. Well, I mean, there's actually a, a um, there is a generational divide. Putin does tend to get more of his votes from, from older voters. Um, 
But the young people don't fall into sort of one category, uh, like young people don't anywhere. Um, there, there's, a, there's a political group called Nashi, which is actually a political movement that's the, pro, the youth wing of the Putin party of United Russia. And they wear, these, actually they wear orange t-shirts with Putin's face on them. And whenever there's an anti-government demonstration, we, see, we often see the Nashi in the streets uh, having a pro-government rally. So there's that group of young people. Um, there's also, unfortunately, a large, younger, a large number of young men, especially unemployed young men, who are drawn to uh, neo-fascist, uh, extreme ultra-rightist parties. And, and a number of young people who are uh, somewhat politically apathetic. Uh, and also you know, uh, people involved in, in societal protests and protest groups. But I don't think right now in Russia we can say that we're seeing uh, a similar movement to, um, to the movement in Ukraine. People just aren't, I don't think, at that point yet. Thank you. My name is Chris, I'm from Russia University. I would like to ask a follow-up question uh, about the relevance of Asia for uh, Russian politics. Um, we could see that uh, under Yeltsin, uh, his visit or his cooperation with China was very well, was very positive for his electoral campaign because he could say that he's not overly Western-oriented, that he can, he can balance that. And by answering the previous question, you suggested that um, the visits of these two leaders in the Russian Far East was probably just a signal towards Japan or the local population, but not for the electoral campaign in Russia as a whole. So how much nowadays does that, how much is their mood, anti-Western mood uh, in Russia, and how does Asia play within, within this, this mood? I mean, I think there is, a, there is an anti-Western mood, and what's been interesting since we've got the tandem leadership is that Putin and Medvedev, to some extent, have played good cop, bad cop with the West. So we hear quite a lot of anti-Western rhetoric from Putin, though it has to be said since uh, the election of President Obama that's actually been reduced. Whereas Medvedev has been much more pro-West, um, and in particular, it's strengthening relationships with the EU as well as with the United States. When it comes to sort of trying to sort of balance this relationship with the West and the East, I don't think the, the strategy has actually been that nuanced in Russia, in, in Russia. I mean, Putin's pursued a very pragmatic foreign policy, I think, looking both East and West, and being willing to do business with whoever's willing to do business with the Kremlin. But I don't think that the anti-Western rhetoric necessarily makes that logical jump into being uh, pro-Eastern or Eastern orientated, but Togo Sensei probably knows more about the relationship. Uh, this is a very interesting question. Uh, you said Asia, yeah? You asked about Asia, but uh, uh, who, who, who is Asia? And I think they the bound to, uh, to come China. And I think for Russian leaders and Russian public uh, likewise, China is uh, becoming an important issue. And the leaders, both uh, Putin and Medvedev, are doing their best to propagate that relationship between China and Russia are excellent. And to a certain extent, it's true. The relations have never been better than today's relationship. And yet, this rise of China, the power of rise of China, and uh, the, the, the Demographic, demographic pressure and the uh, future potentiality of China in contrast to uh, Russia, which is still remaining as energy exporting country. All these add up to us. I think, now correct me, but, or I, I would like to, to know your, uh, I think, create certain fear of China. And what are this, this balancing point is very difficult to, to, to apprehend from outside. But I think at, at least there are two, these two aspects. And here plays in the role of other countries in Asia. And for the moment, it's all countries other than Japan. <laughs> yeah, I, I, as was demonstrated in uh, Medvedev's speech in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Hvarovsk in June last year. All other countries but Japan. But uh, has re Japan really become insignificant to that extent? <laughs> so, so I, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Uh, and uh, if Japan will be able to remedy this situation and to let Russia understand that if Russia is looking, really looking for a counterbalancing power in Asia, 
it can't be other, other country than Japan. This is my, my wishful thinking, but... I agree, and I would I just add one thing. It's actually the security service military element within the Putin uh, Medvedev administration who tend to be the most concerned about the long-term uh, prospects of the rise of China. They're, they're the people who are sort of imbued with the long-term memory of the rivalries between China and Russia during the Soviet period. So um, it's actually that group within the Kremlin, I think, who are most concerned about the rise of China. I'd like to take Sam James informed that the LA Times now I think it will be really research. I'd like to ask a demographic question. The current population of Russia is around 140 million, is that right? When they go down to 100 million, the Japanese will also be at 100 million. <coughs> Spreading 100 million people from the Urals going east, they would probably run out of people long before you get to the northern islands. <coughs> Whereas <coughs> 100 million was the population of Japan in 1967, when they had people pushing people into the Amate line uh, trains because they were so crowded. In other words, Japan is still likely to be a populated country, uh, of which apparently the, the Northern Islands could be totally unpopulated, and, and Japan could have them back by just moving into the Empty houses is that a realistic possibility? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about a realistic possibility. Perhaps the uh, perhaps the mass expanse of space empty all the way from Moscow right through to the northern territories, where there'll still be some uh, still be some residents. I mean, I think it's hard to say, but you're right. In the long term, Russia's demographic problem is it is really is really critical. <coughs> and is going to influence uh, both domestic and international politics. And we're already seeing some illegal Chinese migration across the border into uh, the southern part of Russia. And there's very little that the, uh, uh, without putting a lot more resources into that area, resources that Russia doesn't really have, or doesn't want to spend uh, on, uh, on shoring up that huge and very long border, there's very little they can do to actually stop this migration. I'm not an expert on uh, the migration and, uh, and demographics in Russia, but I, I've been told that there are Chinese people setting up businesses, moving into parts of Siberia, and, and, and moving there for the long term, you know, illegally, but, but becoming part of the local community um, and part of the local uh, business community, too. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. John Martin from ABC. Uh, with the growing importance of social networking sites, do you know if any of the major media outlets in Russia indirectly or directly controls social media in Russia? And do you know what the Kremlin strategy is in this space? The Kremlin has, uh, as far as I'm aware, absolutely uh, hasn't tried at all to uh, control the internet or social networking. Putin, when he was asked about uh, China's policy towards the internet, said that he realized that it was a it was a pointless battle, that there was no way of controlling the internet, and that the the, the Kremlin wasn't going to get involved in some kind of, like, this kind of thankless thankless task. Uh, he didn't say I believe in free media. He said it's a thankless task, and that tells you quite a lot about his thinking on the media. But no, the the, the internet is, is relatively it's relatively free. Miles Elston, Associated Press Television. You said you interviewed a lot of journalists. And I was just wondering what journalists told you was the main restriction as they experienced it. Um, I could think of three possible ways a journalist could be restricted. Um, you could come up with a story that these people wouldn't like. It might be the case that you're restricted and that you take the story idea to your editor and he or she just says, no way, that's off limits. That's one way it could happen. Maybe they experience it in that they actually get to do the story, but then later they get a visit from some enforcer from the state, or, and, uh, and that's how they experience a restriction. Um, the other thing I can imagine is you can have restrictions that, like sometimes you get here, when just the general conservative nature of people around you prevent you from being able to do a story, and, and the, the other staff in your organization just 
like cooperating, doing a story with you, that people like trying to interview an a expert about the royal family, imperial family here. There's no one to interview because no one will talk about it. And so, do they? The third way they could get restrictions is just that the general conservative consensus in society prevents you from doing those stories. What do they say is the main reason? Yeah, it's mainly reason one and reason three. Uh, there's not actually very much direct uh, harassment, and journalists themselves very rarely, or uh, from, from the journalist I spoke to, no one had ever been contacted by the Kremlin. Most of the contact between the Kremlin and the media organizations happens at the managerial level. So the journalists who are actually writing the stories, producing the stories, don't have any contact with the, uh, with the presidential administration or the Kremlin press office. So all of the, uh, all of the pressure goes to the uh, executives running the media organization. So a lot of journalists say that they, they'll, they'll, they'll cover a story and then when it goes to the editors, it will be changed, it will be cut, or it will be put very low on the running order and reduced to 30 seconds. So those kind of practices. Um, a lot of the, the most uh, courageous and, uh, and investigative journalists and curious journalists in Russia have actually been uh, forced to leave their media uh, their media outlets, especially uh, television journalists. Um, when media outlets have been taken over by uh, often state subsidiaries, like when NTV was taken over by Gazprom, it sapped a lot of the most prominent journalists, those who were considered to be troublemakers. Um, and a lot of the journalists were replaced with very young journalists just coming out of uh, journalism school. And these journalists weren't necessarily people who were more compliant but they were often people who'd just grown up in a different media environment. So they were much more interested in producing uh, sort of infotainment kind of style programs and razzmatazz sensationalist pieces about you know, boob jobs gone wrong, for example, rather than investigating hard political stories. So just by, uh, by changing the culture of a lot of these channels by getting rid of a lot of the veteran journalists and bringing in young journalists who just aren't interested in a lot of those kind of uh, questions, that's changed the, 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 the style and, and the atmosphere of media outlets. And also you know, trying to get access to uh, government sources in particular, trying to get people to talk to you is incredibly, is incredibly difficult for those journalists who do remain who want to ask those kind of questions. My name is uh, Chris Schrager from ABC. Um, basically, I would like to ask you if you think the uh, the treatment of the, you said there were some similarities between um, his treatment, the treatment of the media and the Soviet Union treatment, although they're largely different. Is there some similar? Is there some similar aspects to the relationship between um, the Putin administration's treatment of education and like intelligentsia, for example, in the Soviet Union, because the uh, education was largely controlled by the state. There was a very, there was a very dissident movement that emerged. That was, a, it was kind of small running, and they had the high dissident movement. Is there a similar movement developing among journalists, or is that largely controlled under the same system? Uh, yeah, there is a, a similar kind of movement. I, I suppose we, we could term as a, a group called Other Russia, who is kind of a, a, a coalition of different opposition forces. And some uh, quite prominent uh, television journalists, in particular, um, one uh, journalist who created Russia's version of uh, Spitting Image, a, a puppet satirical show called Kukli. He's one of the main voices in this particular movement. But it's also uh, made up of uh, leaders or former leaders of political parties, politicians from the sort of democratic wing or, or democratic <coughs> part of the political spectrum. Also, uh, Gary Kasparov, the, the chess player, the former chess grandmaster, is another voice in this group. So I guess we could call this a, a grouping of intellectuals who are opposed to the current status quo. Yeah, so. The young lady behind you had a hand up for us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your speech. It was interesting for me to listen about television. <laughs> for me as well, though I live in Russia. Uh, but I have two comments. One is about the role of television, though it's true that all the people tend, uh, the main source of information for elder people is uh, still television. But as uh, last events in African countries show, showed us that young people are playing much more um, 
big role in the political life now. And for example, my generation, uh, they don't practically uh, watch television because they see the difference between what is shown in TV box and mm -hmm. what is going out, outside. So it's much more easier to open some website and read all uh, information you are interested in in the internet. So internet uh, plays, and if you look in, in internet, um, it's been mm, very critical towards uh, the present situation. And um, my second comment is about attitude towards uh, latest news um, about what happened between Japan and Russia. Though maybe opinion polls show that the interest was uh, really low. I don't know what was shown on TV, but if you look in the internet, uh, you can see that the interest was really very big and many people, for example, who do not know um, very good the history of this problem, they turned to history, they uh, started being interested in this problem and this problem was um, discussed a lot. But thank you. I would just say thank you for your comments. I, I, I agree that um, the internet is becoming a much more important source of information for young people. And a lot of the research I was doing was based around Putin's becoming president uh, and his first term in office between 2000 and 2004. And I think in that period, internet use in Russia was actually relatively low, especially compared to countries in Western Europe. But since around 2005, 2006, you're absolutely right, it's become a very important source of information. And television, for younger people especially, is, is, is very limited in its impact. I, I agree. I, I, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there are a sort of serious interest among the young people in the internet in discussing the historical background of the territorial issues. Uh, can you give us a little more about the quality of the discussions? <laughs> <laughs> what, what kind, I mean, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I'm not a specialist in politics. Uh, I'm a study economy of Japan. But um, as I do know about the problem, uh, well, um, um, the opinion is, uh, there are different groups of opinion uh, and uh, different levels of knowledge between the people who are discussing this problem. So um, I think it's, maybe it's practically the same as in Japan. For example, if you speak with uh, young Japanese people, uh, some of them do know do know uh, well about the problem, some do not, so it's very hard to say um, about everybody in one word. Again, Mary from uh, Linux of, uh, Professional Institute. My question is, uh, at the, let's say, uh, University of Moscow, uh, I wonder if they have a department called journalism, and if they do, I don't know what kind of uh, education they provide, that's question number one. Number two, uh, you say that the internet is uh, pretty, or let's say, free from control point of view, but how do you know it's free? Uh, it's very difficult to understand uh, how internet could be controlled. Google, for example, they they could manipulate many things without uh, we know. And I assume that the, uh, they do uh, pretty well. All I can say in response to that is whenever I've been looking for, uh, for example, um, one of the Russian newspapers' websites online, I've never had any trouble locating or finding quite critical um, stories talking about the current administration. Google's practices in Russia, I'm afraid I don't know much about. But generally, I think if you if you type in you know, Putin, negative, Chechnya, you're going to get reams and reams and reams of information. So I've never had a problem coming across any, any finding a large body of, of, of work on the internet that's not supportive of the current administration. So based on that very unscientific um, experiment, I would say that the internet is, 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 is pretty free um, in Russia. And sorry, your other point was? The, yeah, the, the, yeah, there is a department of journalism at Moscow State University, and it's um, 
the, the, the head of the department is somebody who writes a lot of very critical books in Russia about the current media uh, situation in his country uh, and teaches his journalists, his young journalists, good, uh, good I think, very good um, professional ethics and skills. Um, but a lot of the young journalists, you know, those who do actually go to work for the media, often don't end up working in news media. They often end up working uh, in uh, entertainment media or other types of media. So people going into news are quite a, a small number of people, but a lot of them are you know, going into work, working for print uh, outlets, are writing really good stories, very curious students investigating important issues, especially societal issues. And one way w in which a lot of journalists who do want to highlight some of the problems with the current political and social situation in Russia get around some of the, the difficulties of reporting about national level politics is they go away and they do good uh, research on what's happening in the regions or they look at corruption at a lo in local government or they look at problems in sort of the housing stock and how this is creating problems for people and their lifestyles and their living standards and although that's not big P political it still has a political impact. So a lot of people are, are sort of, you know, they're skirting around the problems of reporting on national politics by doing what I would consider to be pretty good journalism work in other areas. And that contributes to a, a general, a, a general impression <coughs> that all is not as rosy as perhaps the three main TV channels would like people to believe. My name is Vera Dupach, I'm from Russia. Uh, thank you very much. It was interesting to listen to your presentation. Um, being Russian and living in Japan, uh, I'm of course comparing things. And uh, when I was living in Russia, I was very mu pretty much sure that uh, Russian TV is controlled and all uh, government. But uh, you mentioned that you lived in Moscow, right? A few years. And I'm sure you've been watching lots of TV. And did you watch it in Russian? Yeah, and I spent some time working in NTV's new newsroom as a sort of runner and general dog's body as well. So watching how the news was actually made. So, yeah. Okay, then I think you will agree that uh, Russian television being controlled by the government, still you can watch many political programs on TV and like political talks uh, when uh, politicians are taking part, which I don't observe in Japan at all. Like everything that you see on TV is a um, few things. few things is shokuji, uh, is fashion, is AKB, AKB 48, if I'm mistaken, kawaii, kakui, and stuff like that, right? If I'm mistaken, I'm sorry, but that's what I've been observing for a few years. And um, I've been thinking, is it, uh, is it uh, TV uh, being controlled as well? Is it uh, the government strategy, or is it just cultural thing? <laughs> Thank you. I think this is a question for you about <laughs> uh, On one hand, on one hand, I, I, I cannot uh, agree more that some of, or many of the programs are exactly along the line you, you, you described. But at the same time, to say that there's no serious political debates in the, in the television program, I think, I don't think it is true. Uh, there are, uh, for instance, uh, um, uh, uh, NHK program, 9 o'clock on Sunday morning. <laughs> and uh, there are, I think, uh, at least series of, of programs which are specialized in discussions, on serious discussions on, on political issues, inviting many politicians. And although in terms of the uh, numbers, there are m so many programs about, about eating, <laughs> uh, and so many programs about kawaii, and so many programs about uh, some traveling some travel around Japan, but you know, <laughs> you don't disregard entirely the serious problems in Japanese uh, television as well. And about the Russian programs, uh, I, I think there are, uh, uh, there, as you did, uh, there, 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 there are serious uh, Russian television programs where politicians appear, but in comparison to the quality of the program we have seen under Yeltsin. And after uh, uh, under Putin, there's a vast difference. 
I worked in uh, our embassy in Moscow uh, in the first half of the 1990s, uh, during the first Yeltsin's presidency. And the quality of the discussion was really fascinating. It was a part of the, of the, of the politics of, of Russia. But as you described, after Putin came into, into power, the, the three major television programs, which I have observed occasionally when I visited Moscow, sold out. Sold out. And the, the, the other thing I'd add is that although there are these political talk shows and they still exist, from 2004 onwards they have to be pre-recorded before they were live. So anything could happen, anyone could say anything at any moment. And that gave them a, a real dynamism, which I think they lack. And um, when, I, when I visited state television, um, when I visited Channel One in, in, in Russia, uh, the journalists showed me a list they had of people that they weren't allowed to invite on, to just speak on television. People like Boris Yemstrov were on that list. But also, there were people you were allowed to invite, but they could only be invited to speak before half past seven in the morning or after <laughs> 11 o'clock at night when the audience was small. So that then when they complained and said, well, we're never on TV, they could be told, oh, yes, you are. But they were always on at very unsociable hours. So there are these kind of you know, ways of getting around. You know, uh, like Yavlinsky, right? Yeah, <laughs> like Yavlinsky, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. We've been totally, I'm sorry, I know lots of other questions, but I'll, I'll ask you, I'll take advantage of chairing this, just a very short question to both of you. Tina, you mentioned that the security services are, are quite concerned about China, even the graphic will be about that. The logical conclusion from that is, let's try to improve relations with Japan. That's logical. And, and the same question I would ask Pedro Sensei, it's quite clear that a lot of Japanese policymakers are worried about China. So one of the logical conclusions is to improve relations with Russia. And therefore, from both sides, one of the conclusions is to forget about the northern territories, which are relevant. I mean, they're relevant to both countries. So is this, have we reached from, have we gone from step one, which is we're concerned about China, to step two, which is we have to improve relations with the other. So about your first uh, analysis, that the logical conclusion for both Japan and Russia is to improve our relations, particularly against the background of the rise of China. I, I cannot agree more. But uh, your second conclusion, <laughs> therefore, uh, we have to forget about the Northern Territory. That was not my position. But, I, I, but you know, uh, I have always tried, you know, in my career, I always try to uh, find a mutually agreeable compromise solution before, before the, the, the worst comes. And I'm afraid now it seems that the worst is coming. And uh, uh, as many of you know, I am, I am uh, sort of uh, painfully <laughs> criticizing my own government policy in the last 25 years. <laughs> that uh, we, we were unable to get this compromise solution at a time when the Russian government was prepared to think about it. But whether we have got a real ground zero or see some hope, <laughs> I don't know. When has politics been about logic? Yeah. It, it, emotion is a very important part of politics, especially when it comes to domestic politics, the time of elections. Um, with the election cycle coming up in Russia in the next two years, we're not going to see any movement by the Russian government on the Northern Territories issue. I think we can only expect to see them um, continue with quite a hard line on that, on, on that issue until after the election cycle. But what I would add is that Putin, uh, as I said before, has been a, a real foreign policy pragmatist and although I think a lot of people in Japan were actually hoping that uh, post-Putin would be a better time for negotiations on the Northern Territories, I would actually say I think Putin in some ways is, uh, is Japan's best hope. He settled a border dispute with China quite favorably for the Chinese in exchange for China uh, buying a large number of, uh, of Russian uh, military products settles the border dispute with Norway, Norway uh, spending a lot of money and signing a lot of contracts to be involved in oil exploration with Russia. So in return for economic incentives, Putin's actually been willing to settle territorial disputes. Now, the Northern Territories issue has the added issue of being associated with the Second World War, which is a powerful emotional pull in Russia. But I, I, I think the situation isn't hopeless during the Putin years. May I ask you who in Japan is saying that post-Putin will be better? I think, I don't... You said a lot of Japanese, but who? <laughs> uh, the article I read from the Tokyo Foundation, I can send it to you, Tokyo Foundation. 
arguing that that post Putin would maybe about be a better situation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 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 well, thank you very much. We'd like to thank Togo Sensei and. with limited resources, so we can't do give you an horarium, but we can give you a calendar. <laughs> I have our students, so you each get a calendar. We already have one. <laughs> well, we have very few of them, so we keep them. So thanks again. Um, we have more programs coming up. Always uh, check our events page. Uh, we have something next Monday, actually, um, in, the, in three days with the Harvard Club. Uh, we have a movie event. It's at uh, 6.30 p.m. rather than seven uh, in order to accommodate the, the length of the movie. Uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, give uh, your business cards to one of our students. And by the way, thank you for our student workers who manage everything here, so thank you. Uh, and uh, again, there are donation boxes. And if you give a lot of money on the donation boxes, we'll be able to give bigger calendars <laughs> next time. So, uh, thanks again. And I'm sorry we could not accommodate uh, everybody for the Q&A, but uh, we had uh, time constraints due to the use of the building. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you.